next on AM560, The Answer. Listen to AM560, The Answer, online at 560theanswer.com, on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. Only the biggest stories, only the biggest guests, and only the biggest opinions. This is AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. Tomorrow is Election Day in the city of Chicago for mayor as well as aldermanic candidates. Uh, Jamal Green is making his second run for mayor. And in the uh, closing days of the campaign, as uh, all the other candidates were attacking Ron DeSantis, Jamal Green was focusing his attention on Cook County Commissioner and CTU Flack. Brandon Johnson. Yeah, there's a lot of things about him that we didn't know. Did you know that he's from Elgin and grew up in Aurora? Yes. I've said this repeatedly. My wife and I, we've had to cover our children multiple times as gunshots have ringed right outside our front door. Brandon Johnson, one of the worst of them all, because he's a false flagger. He used these experiences and act like he has lived experiences in Chicago when he is from Elgin. He just got here, went to school in Aurora. And he talks about this one incident that happens on his block and why he should be mayor. He's trying to fool white progressives on the north side of Chicago that he cares about black people. When he don't, he's a commissioner. He's been a commissioner since 2018 on the west side. And the west side has the highest rates of poverty. And he hasn't done one thing about it. Beware of false flaggers. And one more thing. The other thing about Brandon Johnson is they're stealing teachers' dues to fund his campaign. Teachers take money out of their check to give to the union, and the vast majority of that money is going to politics. At the same time he's taking all of their teachers' dues, he's getting a salary from CTU from over $100,000 a year, including his salary as commissioner. Beware, he's one of the worst. J.M.L. Green joins us now, neighborhood advocate, 2023 candidate for mayor, on the ballot tomorrow. And, well, if you've ever voted early, you've already seen him on the ballot. GoGreenChicago.com. GoGreenChicago.com is his website. J.M.L., thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. No, I appreciate you guys for having me. Good morning. Good morning. morning. All right, so um, he's not from Chicago. Well, I mean, Larry Lightfoot's from Ohio. Tony Preckwinkle was born in St. Tony Tony Preckwinkle was born in St. Paul, Minnesota. I mean, what's... Do you have to be from Chicago to be mayor of Chicago? Well, no, I think my my main point in that video was that, you know, he he um when he's on a campaign trail, he tries to act like he's the blackest of of them all, right? Of mm-hmm. like, uh, oh, I'm I'm changing my windows from bullets and I'm from Austin and we got it rough and my kids are, you know, right, you know, see he uses all of these different experiences. He never talk about his real experiences growing up. But he uses these experiences to try to relate to Chicagoans to make it seem like he has, you know, uh, uh, relatable experiences when really he doesn't. And so to me, it's like, all right, as somebody who's from these neighborhoods, who really has these experiences all my life, um, you know, compared to somebody who just got here, you know, probably a little over a decade ago, you know, it's it's a little, um, you know, disheartening and, and a kind of a slap in the face to us to, like, try to basically act like, you're one of us when it's, uh, you know, it's like, no, you know, it's okay to be from where you are, you know, own it, you know, but don't yeah. try to well, make it seem like it's something different. Yeah. And at the hideout the other night, he lied because remember they, you know, they asked you all the candidates, you know, in this Chicago Axios forum, it was, you know, kind of light, you know, lighthearted event. They asked him where he's from. He's the Austin neighborhood, you know, so he lied. So, but anyway, the bottom line, he's been Cook County right. commissioner up from the West side since 2018 and crime hasn't gotten any better. It's In fact, it's gotten worse. Right. And my thing is, you know, with that, and I talk about that a lot because, you know, listen, he was puppeted to take that position. You know, honestly, they, it was Richard Boykin who was against Tony Preckwinkle for the sugar tax, and she wanted to take him out. So she went to the union, and they went and got Brandon Johnson to do so, and they barely won by like 100 votes. Uh, and since then, you know, it's just a, a dog and pony show. You know, they have the highest rates of violence on the west uh, on the west side, the highest rates of poverty on the west side, especially of children. The most children that are in poverty are on the west side without grocery store, without resources. 
and as a commissioner, you would think he would be active in that district, but the vast majority of that district have never seen him and don't even know who he is. And so it's one of those things of, you know, we, we keep on playing politics and they want to go seat to seat because they're trying to take the power and play political games uh, um, to, you know, fight other other political powers uh, where we actually have people that are suffering in the meantime. Uh, so um, what was your experience growing up since you mentioned it? Yeah, I grew up, uh, um, you know, my dad was on the west side of North Lawndale. My mom was in Inglewood as a single mother. So, um, you know, I saw everything firsthand, you know, actually being uh, almost shot multiple times. I uh, lost many of my friends to gun violence. Many of my friends lived in abandoned buildings. Um, you know, I used to w- look out my window and see shootouts, and I would know who's doing the shootouts, right? Like, this is the environment that I grew up in. You know, the folks on the block who are on the corners selling the drugs. Um, you know, I knew all of the people in the neighborhoods who really needed a way out or needed a pathway forward. And I saw a lot of those same people, um, you know, uh, die and uh, from gun violence, and many of them are not here today, and, and some of them are still on those, on those corners in those neighborhoods. How'd you get out? Well, it was because, you know, I, I had a lot of people around me that made sure that uh, they pushed me, you know, uh, on the right path. Because as a troubled kid, I was getting kicked out of schools and, um, you know, uh, going through a lot in, in my environment. But as a teenager, I had mentorship. I had um, programs uh, uh, like uh, summer summer camp. I went to summer camp every summer. Mm-hmm. We had different after school programs, uh, um, you know, uh, Boy Scouts, mentoring organizations, and a lot of mentors. So that's why I really push youth investment so much because if I didn't have a lot of those key things, who knows where I would be? Uh, and that's why a lot of these young people who may be doing the right wrong things right now, if they got certain investment of certain people or programs that can guide them in a different way, they can be, you know, somehow mayor of the city of Chicago one day. Now, hypothetically, if you lose tomorrow's election and there's a runoff between Paul Vallis and Brandon Johnson, who would you be backing? Man, you know, I, I, I would, <laughs> I'm going to say that I believe that that's not going to happen. Okay. Um, and I don't think there's a, a big chance of that happening opposed to what any of the media pundits would say. Um, you know, well, who's going to make the that, final two? I think that tomorrow that we're going to make, you know, the runoff. I'm not going to talk about who's the other person. Um, What the media is discounting is the media has discounted the non-voters as well. uh, You know, the folks in neighborhoods who usually don't vote, who are turning out in this election at high numbers because um, they finally have somebody that comes from them and from their neighborhoods. We know that we have our numbers that we need. Uh, and we're just ready to shock them tomorrow because all of these, you know, bogus polls that they put out um, really have put a cap on the real voices of Chicago. The vast majority of people don't vote and they've been disengaged. So to try to take a small sample of the very small percentage of people that vote um, is, is just, you know, it's an injustice to the political process. Well, let me ask it a different way. If um, you're the candidate uh, or uh, there's any black candidate of the seven black candidates, a black candidate emerges at, in the runoff against Paul Vallis, because that's what it's going to be. Paul Vallis is going to be the other candidate in the runoff. Mm-hmm. Do you see mm-hmm. the uh, black and brown communities, the public sector unions, do you see a consolidation around whoever, let's say it's you, whoever that black candidate is against Vallis? Uh, well, it depends on who that candidate is. If it's me, I'll probably beat Vallis with the majority of the vote, 100 uh, percent guaranteed. But, you know, if it is, you know, somebody different, you know, it, it could be a different story. It's a different story if it's Willie Wilson or if, uh, or if it's Brandon Johnson, um, you know, Why? or if it's Lori Lightfoot. Right. Because well, Lo- Lori Lightfoot, I know. because Yeah. Lori Lightfoot is just she's completely upside down. But, right. but if it's somebody different other than thing. Lightfoot, why would it be different? Willie, Brandon, we'll Roderick, different. whoever. Yeah, it would be different because, you know, like, for example, Willie Wilson is uh, very polarizing, right? And so you're going to have vast majority of the black leadership that is that is going to be, you know, uh, scared or not want to really stand by him and would rather stay out. Um, so, you know, it just it just depends on who it is. If it's Brandon Johnson, he has a black problem. Brandon Johnson is not supported by black voters because black voters have never seen him. Um, and so this is, uh, and black voters vote and support people that they know. And so he's going to have a hard time trying to convince people that, um, you know, he supports black people 
um, black and brown people when he has no track record or accomplishment. So he'll have a hard time, I think, uh, on his end. Now, every candidate says that they're going to, you know, hire more police officers right away. I'm sure you're included in that. But what about dealing with no, Kim no, Fox no, and the, no. the root of the problem? No, you're not. Oh, you're not. Yeah, okay, no, tell no, me. I'm, tell me why I'm not. The one, I'm the one that's not <laughs> saying that, you know, because it's unrealistic to say, oh, we're just going to find these pool of, of officers. we got to be realistic. We have to start to do what works. And if we have a peer responder unit of social workers, right, that's one of the biggest things that I want to do is put $100 million on a peer responder unit of social workers to respond to mental health calls. That's going to take away 40% of the calls from police. So if they can respond to mental health or homelessness, which is almost half of the 911 calls. We put in a youth intervention department and hire youth interventionists that grab young people that drop out or um, get arrested. Um, and, and have the priority resources to mandate them to a mentor and organization and give them free counseling or housing so that they can have uh, um, a pathway to productivity, um, then we'll have a better way out. So getting young people off the streets, making sure they have youth jobs, opening up those schools throughout the day on the weekends, investing in safe spaces um, are some of the things that we're going to do. So, and having a reentry program for those who return home so that they have a better, um, and remove all those barriers for them as well. So during the debates, and I understand the limitations of these candidate debates with 30 and 60 second responses, yeah. but, but everybody uses the word investment, 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 yep. and uses it generically. So what distinguishes the investments you want to make or the policies that you want to pursue with respect to public safety or economic opportunity? What distinguishes your policies? Maybe just give me one example from the rest of the field. Yeah. Well, what distinguishes mine is that, you know, when I, when I use the word investment, that means that, you know, I'm looking to grow our city. And so um, when I say that we're going to use a single family mortgage bond to back home loans in these underserved neighborhoods or have a public bank, right, uh, um, uh, and have a public bank um, so that we can invest in the home loans and the small businesses in these neighborhoods so that we can bring more homeowners back to the community. See, when you talk about the communities that have the less crime, you, the majority of people are homeowners. The, uh, there's no vacancies in small businesses. The, the school system is uh, uh, quality. Um, you know, you have all of these different things. Even the, you know, you go to Lincoln Park, the dog's nicer in Lincoln Park. You know, I mean, everybody, everybody <laughs> nice in Lincoln Park. It's, it's lot, not a lot of trauma. More, a lot of people have, have great stability and family structures and things of that sort. We have to bring that to these neighborhoods and make sure that we um, start to invest in people so that people can have ownership and a stake on their block and really care about what's going on with the schools uh, and create more safe spaces and small businesses. Is there is there a specific program uh, that you think should be replicated or scaled? You know, there's so many social service providers. There's so many programs. They keep being referred to the types of programs. But what, what's yeah. a success story that we can scale. I was watching CBS Sunday Morning uh, yesterday, okay. and they were profiling this uh, Roca program in Baltimore. Roca is Spanish for rock, and it's uh, mm -hmm. basically that the, uh, what they basically do is interventions uh, with uh, guys that are in trouble, uh, uh -huh. almost entirely black, but some Latino as well, um, and it, it's basically cognitive behavioral therapy. It's about sure. teaching young men to have impulse control. And apparently, I mean, at least according to this profile, this program, it's showing some success with those who stay in the program. Is there something like that that you know of or have participated in that you say, this is a model that we could replicate and scale around the city? Well, are you are you saying for a program that's already here or in another city? Because I know you mentioned either another city. E either way, either way. So it's something you know to yeah. give us give us something to say, like point to something and say this works, and it just needs to be bigger or it needs to be replicated on a neighborhood basis. Well, you know what I'll say is you know there's a uh, I have a few. Um, one is there's a program that they have in um, uh, Los Angeles and in, in Louisiana. Um, it is, you know, uh, um, I believe it's called Watchdogs, but it's about dads who actually are securing schools, that we have fathers who are volunteering their time oh, yeah. to come into the schools to patrol in the mornings throughout the day and after school to have a relationship with the kids that are, are moving around the school buildings. I think that is um, one of the biggest things because a lot of young people don't have fathers 
and to have a presence of the fathers in the neighborhoods in the schools um, really, you know, uh, uh, can help a lot of those young people. So that's one thing. Another thing is, you know, um, youth jobs, right? And I know we use One Summer Chicago as an example when we talk about summer jobs, but that program needs to be, you know, changed and be year-round, right? We need more money for the, for the kids as well as it being year-round and allowing for kids as young as 13 years old to be able to participate uh, and small businesses, corporations, senior homes, uh, um, anywhere that is a place of, of, of uh, where things are going on, if they grab one of those young people for a certain amount of hours and a city will pay for them to be in that, in that um, facility um, to help out and learn new skills, right? We need to do that 13 to 25. That's another thing um, that I think is important. Uh, and we got to have one. And the other thing is we had a, a program in the Kiwani prison where we taught, um, you know, those who are transitioning home business plans and uh, um, resume building and affirming them and inspiring them. And what we want to do is have a program embedded in our DLC and Cook County Jail to actually make sure that we're investing um, our, our time into those folks who are transitioning home so that they have a pipeline of resources, that they have temporary housing, that they have a possible job opportunity, that they have what they need to get an ID and things of that sort so that they don't just go right back uh, to the streets um, and do the same thing over and over again. And so um, that's another thing that's important to me. You should check out uh, John Ponder's uh, Hope for Prisoners program out in Clark County, Nevada, on the uh, reentry sure. issue. Uh, Jamal sure. Green is a neighborhood advocate. He's also a candidate for Chicago mayor. On the ballot tomorrow, gogreenchicago.com is his campaign website. Jamal Green, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Punch yep. one. Thank Appreciate you for it. always being a gentleman and classy guy. And he's first on the ballot, no too. So, uh, And he joins us, too, on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's news, opinion, insight. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, The Answer. Hi, I'm Navy Dowdy, best-selling author and executive producer of a new Hollywood documentary called The Baby Boomer Dilemma. In this film, economists and Nobel Prize winning PhDs from Wharton, MIT, and Stanford share a strange concept I call the income doubler. It gives you more retirement income with the same dollar saved, and your money is never at risk if the market crashes. That's right, if the market crashes 30%, you lose nothing. Even people who are on track have shifted money to this new strategy because it increases their retirement income income or can allow